Gentlemen of the jury, you are the judges of the evidence to be laid before you. Be just and fear not, for the true administration of justice is the foundation of good government. Famous jury trials, dramatizations of cases taken from actual court history. The names of persons and places have been altered to protect the identity of those concerned. The state versus Senator James Brown. Tonight, we take you back 25 years to the days before the World War when a wave of moral righteousness was sweeping over America. Its purpose? To prohibit the manufacture and sale of hard liquor. As state after state fell into line and passed prohibition amendments, the struggle became increasingly greater, reaching its climax in a certain Midwest state where, during a prohibition debate, oratory ran high. Mr. President, alcohol is a poison. A poison that rots the body and destroys the soul. We can no longer tolerate its evil in civilized communities. Mr. President, we cannot legislate morality. In the states where prohibition has been tried, has drinking decreased? No, the sale of liquor has simply been taken out of the hands of honest businessmen and turned over to the underworld. So evenly divided was the Senate body on the question of prohibition that when a trial ballot was taken, it was found that the Senate was deadlocked, that the deciding ballot would be cast by an obscure state senator named Archibald Holland, who lay seriously ill in a hospital. To his bedside rushed delegations from both dries and wets, each side seeking to sway the vital vote to its cause. Overnight, obscure Archibald Holland became the most prominent public figure in the state. And when he was wheeled into the Senate chamber on a stretcher to cast the vote that would decide whether an entire state was to have prohibition or not, no one knew for certain which way he would vote. And the spectators were hushed in gripping suspense as Archibald Holland's turn to vote drew near. Herman? No. Herbert? No. Archibald Holland? I. <laughs> the prohibition bill was carried by Holland's deciding vote, and Archibald Holland was the hero of the hour, riding the crest of a wave that carried him only a few months later to the House of Representatives in Washington. And there he was quickly forgotten by the public. But a few months after he had sunk into obscurity, Archibald Holland was again making headlines. He accused one of his former colleagues in the state senate, James Brown, of having offered him a bribe at the time of the state prohibition fight. A bribe to vote against the bill. Brown, accused of offering the bribe. A public whose emotions were still aroused with the memories of the recent bitter prohibition fight crowded the courtroom when the case came to trial and the district attorney called his first witness, John Turvey. What is your occupation, Mr. Turvey? I'm in the wholesale business. Before the prohibition bill was passed, I was in the wholesale liquor business. When that bill was brought up in the state senate, did anyone ask you to contribute money to help defeat the measure? Yes. A man named William Morton came to see me. He told me he represented a group of manufacturers and others interested in defeating the bill. Well, the idea is this, Mr. Turby. If all of us who want to see this bill defeated will contribute something, whatever you feel you can afford, we can easily raise enough money to kill the bill. Well, how will the money be used? For statewide publicity and propaganda against prohibition. And we'll use some of it in the Senate itself if we have to. You mean bribery? Well, the uh, vote in the Senate is certain to be very close. If we can uh, uh, persuade one or two senators to switch to our side, we can defeat the bill. I don't know that I want to be connected with anything like that. Oh, I... it'll all be done very discreetly. We'll see that none of our people are implicated in any way. You see, uh, <clears throat> we work through one of the members of the Senate itself, uh, Senator James Brown. Now, if anything goes wrong, he'll have to take the blame. 
This man mentioned the name of James Brown. Yes. He said Senator James Brown would be given the money to buy enough votes to defeat the bill. That's all, Mr. Terby. Your witness. Mr. Terby. Do you know if Senator Brown ever received any money from this group of men? No, I don't actually know it. Or tried to bribe a member of the Senate? No. Or was in any way connected with this liquor group? Well, Mr. Martin said Mr. That... Martin said. Did you make any attempt to find out if what he said was true? No. That's all, Mr. Turby. Call Angela Brock. Angela Brock. Angela Brock. Angela Brock. What is your occupation, Miss Brock? I'm Mr. Holland, secretary. Congressman Holland, who has brought this charge of bribery against James Brown? Yes. Do you remember last April 18th? Uh, yes. Senator Holland and I took the train down here from the state capitol. Uh, did you see Senator Brown on the train? Yes. He asked Senator Holland to come into his compartment for a chat. What happened? Well, I don't know. You see, he said his business was private, so naturally I didn't accompany them. But when Senator Holland came back, he was in a fury of indignation. He said Senator Brown had insulted him and he would never speak to Senator Brown again. He did not say how Senator Brown had insulted him? No. He said it was better not to say anything more about it. I see. Well, that's all, Miss Brock. Class examined. Miss Brock, you heard nothing of that conversation in the train. No, nothing. You knew that Mr. Brown and Mr. Holland disliked each other. Yes, everyone knew that. And so far as anything Mr. Holland said to you is concerned, he might merely have had an altercation with Mr. Brown. Yes, I suppose so. That's all. Call Congressman Archibald Holland. Archibald Holland. Archibald Holland. Archibald Holland. Uh, Congressman... You were formerly a member of the Senate of this state. That is correct, sir. Congressman, you have been called one of this state's most distinguished public servants. Have you not? Yes, with all due modesty, I think I may say I have been thus honored. One of our most valiant leaders in the fight against vice and corruption. I have done all the lay within my small powers to root out and destroy the forces of evil in this state. I'm sure everyone here is well aware of that. And now, uh, Congressman, will you tell the jury what took place last April 18th when you talked with Mr. Brown in his compartment on the train? Brown said he wished to see me privately. I had small respect for Brown even then, but I consented to the interview. Then Mr. Brown made the most blatant suggestion to me. Harland, if you play your cards right, there's a fortune to be made out of this prohibition bill. I don't understand you, sir. You don't? Well, a certain group of men are willing to spend money like water to defeat this bill. You haven't committed yourself one way or the other yet, have you? No, I am still weighing the merits of both sides of the question. Would uh, $20,000 help you to make up your mind to vote against the bill? What? 5000 now, 5000 more when you come out against the bill, and the balance when you have actually voted against it. Interested? I most certainly am not interested. Of all the dishonorable criminal proposals that have ever been made to me... Mr. Brown tried to buy your vote for $20,000? He did, sir. Well, thank you, Congressman. That's all. Uh, Cross-examine? Uh, yes. Mr. Holland, uh, it is true, is it not, that your name has recently been put forward as a possible candidate for the present vacancy on the Supreme Court of this state? Yes, I have had that honor. Hasn't the name of Senator Brown, whom you have accused of attempted bribery, hasn't his name also been put forward as a rival candidate for the position? I was not aware of it. Isn't it true that you and Senator Brown have for years been personal and political enemies? My liking and respect for Brown have both always been equally small. Ah, I see. Mr. Harlan... You say that Senator Brown offered you a bribe last April, uh, nearly a year ago. That is correct. 
And you waited nearly a year before charging him with that action? Yes, sir. I kept silent because there were no witnesses to the conversation. It was not until talking with the Honorable District Attorney and at his request that I publicly denounced Senator Brown. Oh, no witnesses. Yes, I see. We have only your word for what Senator Brown said to you in the compartment of that train. Unfortunately, that is so. But it would not be possible to doubt the word of as distinguished a public figure as yourself now, would it, Congressman? My word has never been doubted, sir. No, I'm sure it has. You would not tell a lie, would you? No, sir. No cheat? Certainly not. Nor do anything dishonor? No, sir. Now, Congressman... In order to hold political office in this state, you have to have a high school diploma or its equivalent, don't you? Yes. You yourself don't have a high school diploma? No. No, I took the state board examinations for a state diploma, which is the equivalent. Yes. And passed them brilliantly, did you not? I was, uh, well, satisfied with my record. Yes, I should think so. Not a mark under 95. Uh, combien des années avez-vous pensé to be? Uh, how's that? Combien des années avez-vous français étudié? I don't know what you mean. Why, Congressman, you made a grade of 98 in French on your state board examination. Have you forgotten all your French so soon? Your Honor, I object to this line of questioning. Mr. Holland's education is irrelevant and immaterial to this case. The character of the chief witness against the defendant is of vital relevance to the believability of his testimony, Your Honor. Objection overruled. Proceed with cross-examination. Mr. Holland, in these same examinations, you made a grade of uh, 100% in syntax. Will you tell the jury what syntax is, please? Your Honor, I object. Overruled. Syntax, Mr. Holland? Uh, syntax. Uh, syntax, I believe, is a medical term. <laughs> No, Mr. Holland. Syntax is not a medical term. It has to do with the construction of sentences. Uh, John Hurst, stand up, please. Uh, do you know that man, Congressman? Well, yes. You went to live with him just before you took your state examinations, did you not? Uh, yes. And returned to your own home as soon as the examinations were over? Well, yes, he was tutoring me for the examination. I see. And do you know Mr. Hurst's present address? No, no, I don't. Well, then I'll tell you. It is the state penitentiary. He was sent there after being convicted of taking the state examinations for another student. Do you mean to insinuate, to accuse me, to imply that You're I am... 94 in logarithms, Congressman. What is a logarithm? This is outrageous. I will not be submitted to this unheard of, undignified performance. I stand on my record. Congressman, what is a logarithm? Logarithm. Well, uh... <laughs> a logarithm, man. Uh... <laughs> When the defense attorney had thus annihilated the prosecution's key witness, the courtroom spectators believed that a verdict of acquittal was a certainty. But a new surprise witness was called by the prosecution that swung the scales once again against the defendant. We will hear this witness in a moment. Order! Order! Proceed, Mr. District Attorney. Call Martin Rogers. Martin Rogers. Martin Rogers. Mr. Rogers, are you acquainted with the defendant, Senator Brown? Yes. I've known him for some time in a business way. Tell me, Mr. Rogers, did he visit your home one evening early in April of last year? Yes, he did. During that visit, did he tell you of any dealings he had with a certain group whose aim was to defeat the prohibition bill in this state? Yes, he told me all about it. He said he had $100,000 at his disposal to try and buy enough Senate votes to kill the man. Was the name of Senator Holland mentioned? Yes. He said he thought Senator Holland's vote was for sale and he could make the high bed. <laughs> That's a lie. Order, order. Were any attempts made to keep you from testifying here freely? Yes. A few days later, I began to receive anonymous letters threatening my life. Mr. Rogers, were any other steps taken to keep you from testifying here? Any other measure than writing you threatening letters and following your movements? Yes. 
once, one dark night, I was attacked by a man with a knife. He slipped up behind me, but just as he was about to plunge the dagger into my back, something warned me. I jumped wildly to one side, and the knife ripped through my overcoat without harming me. My assailant ran away. And what did you do then? I put myself under the protection of your office. I was determined to testify. I considered it my duty. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. That's all. Your witness. Your Honor, I have no questions to ask. The spectators were stunned when the defense attorney did not even cross-examine the witness whose testimony was so damaging to the defendant. And the district attorney triumphantly rested his case. Open the case for the defendant, please, Counselor. Your Honor, I request an adjournment until tomorrow morning. The defense did not expect the prosecution to finish today and has no witnesses on hand. Very well, then. Court will be adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Why did you do that? You have your witnesses here? There's only one witness who can save us now, Jim. I've got to see her and persuade her to testify. I've got to see her before anyone else does. And have her here when the court convenes tomorrow morning. It's our one chance now. Next morning, the trial was resumed. And the defense attorney opened the case for the defendant, James Brown. Don't worry, Jim, she's here. Uh, may it please, Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, the man responsible for the ridiculous charge that has been brought against the defendant is that pure knight in slightly soiled armor, that great defender of civic virtue, Archibald Holland. <laughs> <laughs> why did he bring this charge, and why did he wait a year to make it? We will show you that Senator Holland was a minor political stooge who happened by chance to be put in the position of casting the deciding vote on an important bill. Overnight, he became the most publicized man in the state. He capitalized on this publicity to run successfully for Congress. But in Washington, he was quietly ignored, quickly forgotten. Archibald Holland had drunk deep of the heady wine of publicity, and he wanted more. What better way than to attack his bitterest political rival with a fantastic charge of attempted bribery? The rival whose name had been put forward for the vacancy on the state Supreme Court which Holland hoped to fill. This is the case for the defense. I call Miss Rogers. Miss Mary Rogers. Miss Mary Rogers. Miss Rogers, you live with your brother Martin Rogers, who testified here yesterday? Yes, I keep house for him. Yesterday, your brother testified that the defendant visited your home one evening early last April. That's right, he did. Were you present? I was. Did you hear Senator Brown discuss a fund entrusted to him to be used to corrupt the legislature as your brother testified? Certainly not. Senator Brown had come to see Martin to try and collect an old debt. He said he needed the money. He scarcely have admitted that he had thousands of dollars in his possession while trying to persuade my brother that he desperately needed the few hundred my brother owed him. You heard no conversation as your brother described to this court yesterday. No, I did not. Was there any time when your brother was alone with Senator Brown when that conversation could have taken place? No, I was with them the whole time. That's all, Miss Rogers. Thank you. Your witness. Miss Rogers, aren't you aware that the conversation your brother had with Senator Brown was considered so damaging in certain quarters that his very life was threatened in a desperate effort to keep him from testifying in this case? No, I'm not aware of any such thing. Do you deny that your brother received threatening letters? Oh, no, he received them all right. He took good care of that. He took good care? Yes. He wrote them to himself. Your Honor, I ask that that answer be stricken as a malicious, unsupported, and unfounded accusation. Motion denied. Miss Rogers, is it true that you and your brother have frequent and violent quarrels? I suppose it must seem that way to outsiders, but it isn't true. I never quarrel with Martin. You mean he quarrels with you? Yes. 
that you don't waste your time quarreling with him, is that it? I suppose you can put it that way. You mean that he isn't important enough for you to quarrel with? Well, you see, Martin's rather like a child with an overgrown imagination. You can't take him seriously. He has to be humored and taken care of. Well, I don't quite know how to explain it to an outsider. Don't trouble, Miss Rogers. That's all. Oh, what of it, Miss Rogers? I want to hear more about those uh, black hand letters you say your brother wrote to himself. But what makes you think that? I came across the paper and ink he used for the letters. They matched the black hand letters exactly. Why, there was even an unfinished black hand letter. Where did you come across this paper and ink? Under his clothes in the bottom bureau drawer. What did you do when you found the paper and ink? I didn't see Martin until he came in late that night. He was uh, pale and wide-eyed. I asked him what the matter was, and he said... They tried to get me. Stabbed me in the back. They tried to stab me. Who tried to stab you, Martin? One of the agents of the Black Hand. He sneaked up behind me and struck him. Something hadn't warned me at the last moment to jump to one side, I'd be lying in the gutter now with a knife in my back, bleeding to death. How dreadful, Martin. As it was, look what happened to my coat. Slept from here to here. Oh, Martin. You don't mean to tell me you've gone and cut your nice spring coat. Let me see. I cut it. It was an assassin that cut it. Oh, Martin. Don't you believe me? Really, Martin. By the way, I found the paper and ink. Huh? I put it on your desk. You know, it's handier there than in your bureau drawer. Paper and ink? What are you talking about? Was ever a man cursed with such a suspicious, crying, and loving sister? What have I done? To... So I mended his coat, and that was the end of the Black Hand episode. He never got another letter. Thank you, Miss Rogers. That's all. That is not all, Miss Rogers. You realize you are accusing your brother of perjuring himself in this courtroom? I suppose it must seem like that to you. But Martin isn't always really conscious of not telling the truth. You see, he has such a vivid imagination, he often thinks that the things he makes up have really happened. That, that's what I meant when I said I never quarreled with him, no matter what he does or says. I wouldn't be able to handle him at all if I lost my temper with him. Miss Rogers, in all my courtroom experience, I have never come across a woman before who accused a relative of so many improbable crimes. That's all. <laughs> we will continue with the trial of James Brown in just one moment. But now, while the defense is calling character witnesses to testify for James Brown, we pause for a brief recess. Now in the courtroom, the defense attorney had dismissed his last witness. Then he turned to speak with his client, James Brown. Jim, I don't think I'll put you on the stand at all. I don't think the wind out of the district attorney's sails. He's planning to make up for the weakness of his own witnesses by giving you the worst in cross-examination. Whatever you say, you're the doctor. I think it's smarter. Will you call your next witness, please, Counselor? I have no more witnesses, Your Honor. Uh, what's that? The defense rests. <laughs> Very well. If there are no motions, you may proceed with your summation. Your Honor... What is it, Mr. Foreman? We of the jury have taken a vote, and we've decided we don't want to hear any summations. What? No summation? Your Honor, this is unheard of. I demand to be allowed to sum up to the jury. This is absolutely unique in my experience, Counselor. But if the jury doesn't want to hear the summations, I don't know of any law that compels them to listen. But, Your Honor, I... I'll take a vote of the jury... All those who want to hear summations, please signify by saying aye. Opposed? No. 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 Very well. We will dispense with the summation. When the judge had finished his instructions to the jury, they retired and remained outside long enough to eat a hearty dinner and then filed back into the courtroom again with their verdict. We find the defendant, James Brown... Not guilty. <laughs> and so ended the trial of James Brown, acquitted after one of the strangest trials ever held. His accuser, Senator Holland, was so thoroughly discredited that he was compelled to retire from public life 
and took up residence in a distant state. Martin Rogers, a few years later, was confined to an institution for harmless victim of persecution mania. And the Senator James Brown went back to his public career and at his death was still a distinguished political figure in his state. Famous jury trials, the drama of the courts, drawn from actual courtroom 